Hey booktube, welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg. Thanks for joining me here today for this book haul. Um, from All these books are from the University Press of Kansas. And uh, this was probably one of their last big sales. And these are the books that I, I snapped up while uh, Kansas Press folks were having just a ton of different sales. Oh, they had a wonderful list where it was like every Friday they'd updated this list of books that were like five dollars or something it was insane now that was only for a limited time <laughs> but in, in the meantime i i picked up a ton of their books that have um, rounded out my library on uh, several different topics um so without any further ado first of all it's uh friday afternoon here and uh, it's raining which is unusual for colorado it's either sunny or snowing. Um, so I was just running errands and I'm going to make this video for you guys. And uh, yeah, let's see if you find something here that you like. And maybe maybe I can bend the ear of University Press of Kansas to see if they might start up their, uh, their weekly sale list again, because that would be fantastic. Um, let's start with, I'm going to say I've got a bunch of Civil War books. So hang on for those or fast forward, whatever you want to do. But we're going to start off with, um, let's start off with some World War II stuff. I wanted to get this book uh, because I love reading about D-Day. And funny that this book should come up because I'm actually batting around an idea. And it might just be me doing it, but I might have someone else join me. I don't know. Um, June is the June marks the 80th anniversary month of D-Day this year. So I kind of want to do something for uh, to recognize it, to elevate some uh, reading recommendations, some reading ideas, uh, movie recommendations, um, historical fiction. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm batting it around right now, guys. But anyway, this book will probably feature in that month uh, once I figure it out. But... This is D-Day 1944, um, edited by Theodore A. Wilson, and it's a foreword by John S.D. Eisenhower. We recognize that name, don't we? Um, so yeah, this is University Press of Kansas uh, the title. And let's see here. This came out, this was published in 1971. Um... And I, I'll just read a, a blurb on the back here. Um, this is uh, 50 years is a long time in the action-ridden 20th century, and yet D-Day seems as new as yesterday. Um, it is not merely a piece of history. It is unforgettable history. In these thoughtful and eloquent essays, general readers together with veterans and their families will see again what was required during that longest day in the lives of tens of thousands of America's young men. Stephen uh, Ambrose, who has written his own book on D-Day, uh, said of this book, D-Day 1944 contains essays by the world's leading scholars on the invasion of France, covering all aspects of the greatest amphibious assault in history, combining new information and scholarship in a highly readable and instructive volume. Um, Again, so it's it's a dated book, but I'm kind of, uh, I just, I'm collecting as many books as I can about D-Day. Uh, there's another book I'd like to to uh, reintroduce to everyone in June, and it's it's called um, <clears throat> Arguing for Overlord. So basically, it, the whole, it's a history of how they made the case for D-Day. It's not even D-Day. It's about how they were trying to make the case. The military uh, masterminds, the strategists, um, how they made the case like we need to we need to invade and it has to be on the north shore of France and not the underbelly um, in the Mediterranean. I know Churchill wanted to go to the upper, you know, he wanted to hit the underbelly. But, um, you know, advocating for overlord, that's the name of the book. So more to come in June. But uh, so I picked this one up because, again, I think it's just a, a must have. And again, a, a forward by uh, John S.D. Eisenhower. So he's either the Maybe the son or the grandson. Um, 
Yes, fantastic. Um, and then Omar Bradley even has a foreword uh, in here. Uh, General, Army, General of the Army, Omar Bradley. And a very nice introduction by Theodore A. Wilson. So a nice, beautiful copy. was so happy to get this during their uh, Kansas Press's uh, most recent sale, which was actually last year. <laughs> Just getting around to showing you guys these books now. Because, housekeeping note, um, the history shelf has grown. I, I actually saw a... I saw a quote from someone or a comment that said, wow, you haul all these books and yet that bookshelf behind you never, never gets any bigger. Well, you have to understand, I, I live in a, a two-story home, uh, four bedrooms. Um, I have a front room that is, uh, I've teased in one of my other short videos. Uh, I have a wall of bookshelves in the master bedroom. And um, so these books are getting moved around. Um and, but the, yes, they, there are some piles starting to form. So Peg, talking in third person, you know it's serious when uh, I refer to myself in third person. Peg needs to buy, um, Peg needs another bookcase. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where that would look nice in the house. So, uh, you know, Martine's putting up with me. Um, she's so sweet. Uh but I did mail off a bunch of books today, too. So I'm trying. I'm trying to move them out as they come in. Also, housekeeping note. Um, maybe next week when I make videos next week, you're going to see a little bit of difference. You might see a desk that's going to be coming out. I ordered a new desk because the history shelf is outpacing itself. I am moving in all a bunch of different directions. And I have a lot of work and I need, I need to have stuff on the side, and I need to have stuff over here. This little desk is not maintaining everything that I, uh, I'm doing. <laughs> so, but it's exciting stuff. You know, I'm an editor. Um, I'm an editor now, and uh, as well as a freelance book reviewer, and uh, I've got books coming in. I've got books I need to send out. It's just a lot of toing and froing here at the History Shelf. Um, so exciting times so you're gonna see me and I, I'm I even ordered a new desk chair I'm trying to make things comfortable because I spend so much time in this office and at this desk so my new my new chair will have a headrest because I really kind of need that and this mess chair meth this mesh not mess <laughs> no this mesh chair as you can see it doesn't provide a lot of comfort a lot of cushion for the bottom area so Peg's, uh, Peg's uh, branching out here, getting new things. Okay, back to the books. Um, next book I picked up. Oh, oh, I should have. You know what? No, I'm going to do that in a separate video. I've been collecting the works of this historian. Um, and this is another one of his standalones that I wanted to pick up. Now, I have his magnum opus four volume a set on the Battle of Stalingrad, which is downstairs in another bookshelf location. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make a separate video on that sometime soon when I'm ready to commit to a reading uh, project. It is a massive undertaking. Anyway, this is Do uh, David M. Glantz uh, and Jonathan M. House, and this is When Titans Clashed, How the Red Army Stopped Hitler. This is the revised and expanded edition. So uh, I've got several of his books now obviously the uh, the four volume uh, set on Stalingrad but he's written a lot of other books I think he wrote a book on Barbarossa but he's a specialist um, on uh, the uh, Soviet Union Army the the um, the battles on the Eastern Front and uh, yeah he is he's the go-to guy so uh just a wonderful edition from university press of kansas i'm just gonna say kansas press okay um let's tell you a little bit about this on first publication this uncommonly concise and readable account of soviet russia's clash with nazi germany utterly changed our understanding of world war ii thoroughly revised and updated to reflect recent russian and western scholarship this new edition is the most informed and compelling perspective on one of the greatest military confrontations of all time. Um, this is part of their Modern War Studies uh, series. Oh, and I should say, okay, so 
The Stalingrad books that Gl Glantz wrote were a trilogy. So it's a trilogy, but I have four books. So the third one was broken up into two, kind of like Twilight, the movie. <laughs> Sorry, how could I how could I compare this man's work to Twilight, the movie, Breaking Dawn, Breaking Dawn Part 1 and Breaking Dawn Part 2? No. Um, so I have the I have the trilogy, but it's four books because the I think it was the third one was the one that was broken in two. But yeah, so this one is how the Red Army stopped Hitler. Kind of an, a broad overview. Um, and this one came out in, I think the revised the revised edition came out in 2015. Oh, isn't that fascinating? He he. He actually um, dedicates this book, this revised edition, to Professor Theodore Wilson, who made the original project possible. So I'm wondering if he's referring to this same Theodore Wilson. Maybe so. All right, so I got when Titans clashed. You know, if you ever just want to uh, stay, I don't know if you guys are on uh, X or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, um, Kansas Press is pretty active on, on those social media outlets and they will let you know when they're having a sale. So, and there's also a bot, I think it's called university press bot. And it, it, it will, uh, tell you every single type of sale that's going on at every university press that they can get their hands on. So, um, but I highly recommend Kansas press. They have some gems folks. So check them out, follow them on Twitter or X and, and you can kind of, you know, hop onto the next sale. Um, all right, let's move. Now we're kind of jumping around here. Okay, now we're going to go to a Vietnam uh, era book that I I was just really intrigued by because I, I've gotten a couple of books about the Tet Offensive. Um, and I like hearing different viewpoints on it. And this one it sounds really uh, provocative. This is The Myths of Tet, the most misunderstood the most misunderstood event of the Vietnam War by Edwin E. Moyes. All right, yeah. Got a nice hardcover of this. This published in 2017. So let me tell you a little bit about this one. Late in 1967, American officials and military officers pushed an optimistic view of the Vietnam War. Military Assistance Command, uh, Vietnam, otherwise known as MACV, said that the war was being won and communist strength in South Vietnam was declining. Then came the Tet Offensive in 1968. In its broadest and simplest outline, the conventional wisdom about the offensive, that it was a military defeat for the communists, but also a political victory for them because it undermined support for the war in the U.S., is correct. But much that has been written about the Tet Offensive has been misleading. Edwin Moyes shows that the communist campaign shocked the American public, not because the American media exaggerated its success, but because it was a bigger campaign, larger in scale, much longer in duration, and resulting in more Amer American casualties than most authors have acknowledged. The uh, Military Assistance, Assistance Command Vietnam, led by General William Westmoreland, issued regular estimates of enemy strength in South Vietnam. During 1967, intelligence officers at MACV were increasingly required to issue low estimates to show that the war was being won. Their underestimation of enemy strength was most extreme in January 1968, just before the Tet Offensive. The weak communist forces depicted in MACV estimates would not have been capable of sustaining heavy combat month after month like they did in 1968. Let me just continue on because this is fascinating. Moyes also explores the errors of the communists using Vietnamese sources. The first wave of communist attacks at the end of January 1968 showed gross failures of coordination. Communist policy throughout 1968 and into 1969 was wildly over-optimistic, setting impossible goals for their forces. While acknowledging the journalists and historians who have correctly reported various parts of the story... Moyes points out widespread misunderstandings in regard to the strength of communist forces in Vietnam, the disputes among American intelligence agencies over estimates of enemy strength, 
the actual pattern of combat in 1968, the effects of Tet on American policy, and the American media's coverage of all these issues. So that's another valuable uh, insight into Tet. I've got a couple of others on this. I have another book. I don't. I think it. I don't know. I think it's about Tet, or maybe overall. It's called This Time We Win or something like that. And that's more of like a revisionist history of, I think, the Tet Offensive. Um, so I wanted to get this as well because of the fact of the uh, the reporting of the numbers. They were either underestimated or, um, yeah, it just didn't correlate with the actual way the <clears throat> battles unfolded. So being a military history geek, you know, I kind of, uh, I kind of, um, lean into these type of things. So, The Myths of Tet by Edwin Moyes. Next book I picked up. Uh, you know me, I love I love some good books on spies and Cold War. And this is, these are all nonfiction. These are all history. Um, so I wanted to add this to my uh, fairly decent uh, library collection of uh, Cold War, espionage, um, things like that. This is Red Spies in America, Stolen Secrets, and the Dawn of the Cold War by Catherine A.S. Sibley. Um, not too big of a book there. Nice little paperback. Came out in 2004. And, uh, let's see here. Definitely have you know, your standard photographs. Uh, I don't have a blurb to read to you, but I think these are, this is Ethel and uh, what's his name, Rosenberg on the front here. Let's see here. Um, I'm trying to look for the, um, the photo credit, but anyway, uh, some of the chapters, we've got espionage in the 1930s, Soviet agents in the national emergency, 1939 to 41, penetration of wartime military industrial targets, Soviet spies, the atomic bomb, and the emerging Soviet threat, Cold War consequences of World War II espionage, and Chapter 6, Soviet and Russian spies since World War II. So, outstanding. Oh, we have a list of illustrations. These are all the folks that are going to show up in this book. We get J. Uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer. J. Robert Oppenheimer is on there. Um, so yeah, looks pretty pretty good. Um, let's see here. If there's a good. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't read anything by Catherine A. S. Sibley, so it looked interesting, and the, the cover is just pff, goes pow. Very vibrant, catches the eye. Continuing on, uh, now one of these books I had I had um, hauled in a previous, oh, probably over a year ago, um, I had hauled in a previous Kansas Press um, book haul because again they were having sales for a long time, and I picked up this first volume. Well, then I was able to get the second volume in this last sale. So let me, this is a duology uh, from Alan R. Millett on the Korean War. And these are two beautiful heart, uh, soft covers. So the first volume we have here is The War for Korea, 1945 to 50, a house burning, I can speak, Alan R. Millett. And then I picked up in this last round of books, the second book, it's by far by far the bigger one um, from uh, War for Korea, 1950 to 51. They came from the north. And I like how they juxta. They have one is in red and one is in blue. And it's just a very smart design. Very clean. I do like book design, book jacket design. Um, as you can see, this is a really, it's a thick one. Uh, okay, I take that back. They keep, they keep proving me wrong. I said this was a duology, but apparently I'm missing another one. <laughs> I got to get my act together. Um, it says here on the back of volume two that it's a, uh, it's volume two of Alan R. Millett's monumental Korean War trilogy. 
I have problems. I have I have problems with trilogies, quartets, and duologies. I I call them things that they're not. Um, so I need to find the okay. Well, which one is it? I'm gonna have to find which volume I'm missing. Okay, um, but uh, you know, nicely illustrated throughout as any history book would with the photographs of the period. You know the drill. Awesome maps, the invasion. But I'm also interested in the Korean War. Uh, so I'm on a quest. I'm on a quest for fun. No. <laughs> That's National Lampoons. Okay, so I've got these two volumes in the trilogy, and I'm going to find out what I'm missing and try to get the third one. Okay, so there you have it. Boom. All right, we're getting close to the Civil War roundup here. But in the meantime, I thought this was kind of interesting. This also fits under their Modern War Studies a series of books. This is Yamashita's Ghost, War Crimes, MacArthur's Justice, and Command Accountability by Alan A. Ryan. Uh, la, la, la. Yeah, like I said, Kansas Press has some interesting stuff. Um, this came out in 2012. And let's see here. I'll read the blurb from a Journal of Military History. Ryan, one of America's leading experts on military law and war crimes prosecutions, authored a meticulously detailed and thoroughly researched account of the prosecution of Japanese General Tomoyuki Yamashita at a U.S. military commission in the immediate aftermath of World War II. Throughout Yamashita's ghost, Ryan fully and accurately presents the facts and the law of the well-known and historically significant case in a highly readable and gripping fashion. The author provides the reader with a captivating narrative of the intricacies of the politics, personalities, procedures, and pitfalls of the U.S. Military Commission. A brilliant storyteller, the author details the challenges and triumphs of the military prosecution and defense teams as they do battle in this first war crimes trial after World War II. Um, Ryan powerfully punctuates the account with vivid descriptions of the barbaric and widespread war crimes committed by Japanese forces in the Philippines, giving the story a grittiness and heart-rending quality, which is normally absent in most historically-based legal scholarship. So, yeah, another dramatic cover, for sure. Uh, I'm not really, I don't know much about this particular war crimes trial um, of Yamashita, but I'm sure it is going to be very graphic and, and, and hard to read. Um... Let's see here. There's a picture of the courtroom, which is pretty dope. Let's see if I get a picture. And here's, oh, here we go. So we got Douglas here, uh, Douglas MacArthur. And then you got Yamashita there. Yeah, does it look like he's missing a leg? Or is it... It's kind of crazy. Okay. Um, so at the time, I was just like, it was on sale, and I was like, this is different. So I picked it up. Yamashita's Ghost. Okay. Uh, this is probably... Yeah, this is definitely not a, an easy read. It's not going to be light and breezy. Definitely an, acad an academic work. But again, I think at the time it was $5. It was a hardcover. It was intriguing. And I said, yeah, what am I going to lose? You know, I can always donate it if I'm not, you know, into it. But I picked up Justice Among Nations on the Moral Basis of Power and Peace by Thomas L. Pangle and Peter J. Ahrensdorf. Again, nice brand new hardcover. This book came out in 1999. Uh, it says here, in the post-Cold War era, we have lost the clarity that once characterized our vision of international conflict. I can speak. You know what it is? I need a sip of something cold. Thank you. 
foreign affairs are no longer defined solely by the ideological battles fought between capitalism and communism or by the competition between two great nuclear uh, superpowers. That oversimplified view has been replaced by an increasing awareness of the moral and political complexity surrounding international relations. Now, again, this was written 25 years ago. So to help us deal with this new reality, the authors provide a critical introduction to the most important conceptions of international justice, spanning 2,500 years of intellectual history from Thucydides and Plato to Morgenthau and Waltz. Their study shows how older traditions of political philosophy remain relevant to current debates in international relations and how political thinkers through the centuries can help us deepen our understanding of today's stalemate between realism and idealism. Uh, Pangle and Ehrensdorf guide the reader through a sequence of theoretical frameworks for understanding the moral basis of international relations, the cosmopolitan vision of the classical ph philosophers, the just war teachings of medieval theologians, the revolutionary realism of Machiavelli, the Enlightenment idealism of Kant, and the neorealism of 20th century theorists. <laughs> you won't be taking this one into the bathroom with you, that's all I'm saying. They clarify the core of each philosopher's conceptions of international relations, examine the appeal of each position, and bring these alternatives into mutually illuminating juxtaposition. Wow, there's a lot going on here. Um, yeah. Heavy on the philosophy. I think my friend John David would really be into this. Um, you know, it's interesting. The first chapter, though, I would read because I, you know, I love reading about the Greek, uh, the Greek uh, writers, tra tra tragedians, the historians. And the first chapter is on classical realism. Yeah. Uh, Focusing on Thucydides, right? Um, so, I mean, there's there's things in here I think I would love to tap into. The Christian teaching on just war, I think, would be a great um, great one to pick up. But yeah, this they go. He goes into de they both go into detail. Both these authors, uh, Hobbes, Machiavelli, Locke, it's all here, baby. So, justice among nations. All right, now we're going to get into some of these awesome titles, Civil War history titles from Kansas Press. Um, I'm going to start off with these two. They're still shrink-wrapped because I want them to be until I can find out where they're going to go on my shelf. Um, but I had never seen this before, and this is a Rebel War Clerk's Diary. I've got two volumes. Um at the Confederate States Capitol, Volume 1, April 1861 to July 1863, by J.B. Jones. And this is edited by James L. Robertson, Jr. This is a very loose... I think they just kind of threw this on here. Um, but yeah, it's uh, J. John B. Jones's... Um, his... his you know, what he witnessed inside the war office uh, in the Confederacy. Um, and Stephen E. Woodworth says this is a classic of Civil War literature and an indispensable primary source for wartime Richmond and the inner workings of the Confederate government. Gary Gallagher has got a blurb on here. Um, yeah. I, you know, I was intrigued. And it was $5, and I am a Civil War fanatic, and I read widely um, on that, and I, I love reading diaries. So, uh, you know, it kind of takes you into the belly of the beast in this one. Second volume is bigger. It's uh, from August 1863 to April 1865. J.B. Jones. So I'm just going to leave the shrink wrap on until I can... I, get my brand new bookcase <laughs> at some point so I can put these up. Um, but yeah, you can only find these at um, University Press of Kansas, baby. So uh, if you're interested, I'd go there now. A lot of these still have copies. The next one I picked up is Victors in Blue, How Union Generals Fought the Confederates, Battled Each Other, and Won the Civil War. 
by Albert Castle and with Brooks D. Simpson, who wrote a great book, Triumph Over Adversity, about Grant, which I, I love. That was a long time ago he wrote that, but it still, it still stands out in my memory. So Victor's in Blue. This one is came out in 2011 and goes over the, you know, the, the usual suspects, Grant. Uh, a lot of Grant. Um, you got Ro Roscrins in here. Uh, Sheridan, Sherman, Thomas, you know, uh, Mead, obviously. So we don't, I don't have like a jacket description to read for you, just the blurbs on the back, but um, uh, it's it's your standard kind of like Grant and Roscrans at Iuka and Corinth, Roscrans at uh, Stones River, you've got your, your woodcuts or whatever these are called. Um, yeah. Oh, there's Thomas, Thomas and Mead. That's my guy. Well, it's not Grant. Grant's my guy, but I really love George Thomas, man. George Henry Thomas. He was a Southerner, and he fought for the Union. And he lost his entire family because of it. They all turned their backs on him. But he was loyal. It cost him everything. I mean, he was one hell of a general, too. He was one hell of a fighter. You know what I'm saying? So, Sheridan Sherman. So, a nice little volume on uh, Victors in Blue. I'm a big fan of that. Yay! Uh, then I've got a few books on Grant. Uh, I did not know about this one. And then I saw it and I was like, I have to have it. This is a very large book. Over 700 pages. The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant by Charles W. Calhoun. It's a fairly thick, um, what do you call it, a trade paperback or something, soft cover. The Presidency of Ulysses S. Grant. Um, and this isn't part of their American Presidency series. They have it all. They have it all at uh, Kansas Press. Look at, look at all the presidents that they do. Right, they're doing... That's amazing. Um, this one came out in 2017, and then the first paperback edition came out just last year. So I got a really nice, the new paperback edition of it. Um, let me just read a blurb. It says here, uh, this extraordinary history helps restore the reputation of a genuine American hero. This volume, the first to cover the Grant presidency in over two generations, is a window in eight years of success and attempts to reconcile sections of a country still at war with itself. The author is fair in portraying Grant as energized, patriotic, and loyal, sometimes too loyal. Far from being a corrupt administration, Grant's strengths as a leader have a profound positive effect on American culture and civil liberties for African Americans, the American economy, and diplomacy. This is a must-read for all who cherish the American Republic. So another great addition to my Grant collection. Um, and these, since we're talking about, oh, I just realized who I'm saving for last. Ew, <laughs> it's okay. These two books I picked up separately. They had another sale very recently. So these books were the most recent things I picked up from uh, Kansas Press. And it is, uh, the, they're reissued. These are not new works by Stephen Woodworth. These are uh, just reissued in a, in a nice um, two-volume, I guess you case set. But we have, um, Grant, it's Grant's Lieutenants from Cairo to Vicksburg, edited by Stephen E. Woodworth. So here's this, I just, I picked both of them up on a sale just um I forget how much they were off, but, um, yeah, these are a collection of essays on his, his lieutenants. So we've got, uh, Sherman and Grant at the fall, uh, to the fall of Vicksburg by John F. Marsalek. Stephen Woodworth has his own in here as well. Um, 
He wrote, oh, cool. He wrote one on William H.L. Wallace, better known as Lou Wallace, better known as the author of Ben-Hur. Um, another essay on Grant and Charles Ferguson Smith. Another one on Lou, Lou Wallace. Um, an essay on Andrew Hullfoot and Grant. Ooh, this one sounds good. The Failed Relationship of William S. Roskrins and Grant by Leslie J. Gordon. Um, yeah, some interesting picks here. So David Dixon, ooh, David Dixon Porter. There goes my uh, Voxer. Let me mute that real quick. Um, so this, yeah, this uh, first volume is from Cairo to Vicksburg. And then the next one I picked up uh, is from Chattanooga to Appomattox. So and again, nice little mixture of blue and blue and red here. Um, and in this one, oh yeah, William Sherman. And we've got one on George H. Thomas, the one I was just talking about. And that one is written by Stephen E. Woodworth. That one is, uh, his nickname was known as Old Slow Trot. <laughs> There's a, yeah, that's awesome. Um, we've got one on George G. Meade, oh, Fran Siegel, Benjamin F. Butler. They're all here. David Hunter, Lou Wallace, Horatio Wright, Philip Sheridan. Edward O.C. Ord and Henry W. Halleck. So, again, two must-have editions for my Grant and Civil War library. Very, very happy to have these. Now, this book here, I think this, this will seal the deal. I don't need any more books on this person. I think I've got all the major ones. Um, but I didn't have this one, and I'm like, well, let's just go ahead and get it and round it out and call it good. But this is uh, Jefferson Davis, Confederate President, by Herman Hathaway and Richard E. Berenger. Um, I've got a hardcover biography downstairs. I'm trying to remember who wrote it, but it was like Jefferson Davis, American, or something like that. That was the most recent one I picked up. Oh, I picked up one written by, um, was it William Calhoun? trying to think um i have a few biographies now on jefferson davis so i think i'm done i'm not going to be buying any more <laughs> i don't think there's anything more that can be said uh about the bro um I, he's just so unsympathetic a character to me he's just you know yeah People have their own opinions about the Confederacy, and but you know I I have mine, and it, to me he's a traitor. And but he was the worst kind because he wanted to keep fighting. It like he wanted everyone to like scatter into the woods and keep fighting guerrilla warfare, and like no, you know that the country never would have gotten back on its feet. Um, at least Lee surrendered, you know. So this is this is fruitless. This is useless. Let's just let's just you know it's over. But no, not not Davis. And then he wrote two a two volume um, defense of secession as a constitutional right in his, uh, his autobiography or something. Um, it just turgid and his prose was just awful. And uh, but I have those two just for the historic record. I have those two volumes. Um, but yeah, he is this the most. Um, what do you what would you call him an unreconstructed rebel i mean he he definitely was and uh i just you know, i read about people i don't like because in it's part of history i mean hell i mean look at all the books i have on hitler stalin mao <laughs> again my 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 minor is in you know uh totalitarian uh murderous despots you know what i'm saying and anyway but I like to uh, understand what makes people tick, if we can ever get to that revelation, you know. Um, but yeah, he's a he's a strange one, Jefferson Davis. I don't I don't like him. I don't like him at all. So that rounds out um, my recent, somewhat recent. These two were recent. I picked these up very recently, but these are the latest. Kansas Press titles that I picked up uh, for my uh, my library, and I can't 
say enough about them. They have a wide variety of uh, books on their site, as a history. Um, just, I mean, just check it out. I again, I love university presses. I'm always there for it. I'm always there to support and to uh, purchase and to uh, read. I enjoy these books so much. So let me know what you think of these in the comments below. I love hearing from all of you. Um, I am off now to do some reading and writing. I think the rain has stopped. Um, this weekend, we may get to putting together the desk. Martine has graciously offered to help me with it because it is a big undertaking. This room could be wrecked for a little while because I'm going to have to move the big bookcase, which is off camera right here, floor to ceiling. The new desk is bigger, so I'm not going to have space for this bookcase anymore, which means all the books that are on there are going to be stacked somewhere until I can move it and maybe purchase some new, um, a couple more bookcases. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Woo! So there you have it. Uh, it's going to be a fun weekend. We'll see. It may not get done. Hopefully it will because uh, I need I need working space over here. It's crazy. Anyway, guys, I just I just uh, miss just chatting with you as much as I can chat looking at this camera by myself. But I know you're out there. I know you're seeing me. All right. Also, let me wish you all a happy Easter coming up on Sunday. Uh, I know today is Good Friday, and I. I was thinking of going to a service, but I, I worked until 12, so I, I couldn't make it out to a Good Friday service. But anyway, if I don't post a video before Sunday, I just want to wish you all happy Easter um, and um, happy weekend. You know, whatever is your, whether you believe you're a person of Christian faith or not, I just want to wish you a good weekend. And to all the Christian, my fellow Christians out there, happy Easter. Have a blessed Easter. And uh, yeah, I hope to hear from you guys. Let me know what you're reading and uh, what you think of these books. And check out Kansas Press. They uh, have a lot of great stuff. So until next time, BookTube, thanks for joining me here on The History Shelf. We'll be back sooner than you know it.